Thank you everybody for helping me with this. Again, I do welcome you. I am Joey Garish, President of Wakefield Alliance Against Violence. Wakefield Alliance Against Violence works tirelessly to educate and promote healthy relationships at every age level. June, being Elder Abuse Awareness Month, we are pleased to have this opportunity to continue our work by sharing and exploring with you the many forms of domestic violence experienced and or seen in our senior community. WAVE provides available resources to victims, perpetrators, and observers to find immediate help and assistance. Please feel comfortable and safe reaching out to us for any reason. It is my honor now to introduce our first speaker, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about this person. Kate Lipper Garabedian serves as, a sta as the state representative for the 32nd Middlesex District composed of Melrose and parts of Wakefield and Malden, a, a position she has held since March 2020 Representative Lipper Garrettin is a member of the committee's House Ways and Means, Telecommunication, Utilities, and Energy, Financial Services, and Elder Affairs, of which she serves as Vice Chair. Prior to joining the State House, Representative Lipper Garabedian served in numerous public service roles. Her first job was as a seventh grade public school teacher in an economically disadvantaged neighborhood of Atlanta. After graduating from Harvard Law School, she worked as a judicial clerk in the federal courts, a legal consultant, and as the chief legal counsel at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Education. Representative Kate Lipper Garibaldian held earlier elected office as, as Melrose City Councilor at Large. Representative Lipper Garabedian lives in Melrose with her husband Mark and sons Harrison and Oscar and the family dog Byron Barron. And Harrison is with us today. Thank you so much, Joey, and thanks to everyone for being here. This is a great crowd for the first day of summer. It's lovely to be with you. And Harrison helped me out with these slides yesterday because he's in Melrose Public Schools, and so his last day was last week. So I just thought it would be helpful to give you all a sense of some things that we're working on in the legislature because we're very aware of the importance of making sure our state policies are responsive to the population. We know that Melrose, Wakefield, the 32nd Middlesex, as well as the Commonwealth and the country is aging. So 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day in the country. And so our laws need to keep up with the needs, the services, the resources to be available to support everyone as they age with a lot of agency. So I thought I'd go over just briefly a little introduction, although you've already done a wonderful job talk a little bit about the Elder Affairs Committee and what we're working on. Um, as Joey mentioned, I'm the House Vice Chair, so I'm pretty familiar with a lot of the bills that have been filed around our senior population. Some efforts here in the district, and then I can close, and if there are any questions, um, and of course you can be in touch with me at any time. So if you wanna go. So that's the district that Joey re reflected in her comments. Um, I've been the representative for the 32nd Middlesex since March 2020. I was sworn in as the state's first COVID representative. So I went around campaigning and door knocking around all of my district of Wakefield, getting to know you all really well. Um, but then COVID happened, we weren't expecting it. And so I was sworn in in this socially distanced, if you can go back one slide, socially distanced um, uh, ceremony where Governor Baker and I were sort of six feet apart and a few people were watching us and we weren't wearing masks at the time because it was just before the recommendation came out to be masked. So it was quite a snapshot literally of where we were as a country. And I'm just excited now to have my second full term be fully in person back in the State House. If you come down to the State House, I'll be there or my legislative aide will be there. We'd be happy to see you. It just makes the job much more enjoyable and I'm sure for everyone, we're happy to be back in person. Um, so next slide. So I have been on the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs. This is my second full session. 
Uh, last session, I was pleased to be selected to be the vice chair of elder affairs. It's an area that I didn't know a lot about because my previous professional role was all in the education space, so sort of the other end of the life spectrum. And I've learned a lot with the chairs, Chair Tom Stanley on the House side, Pat Jalen as the Senate chair. And we've been holding hearings this session on a variety of bills. I think we have about 60 to 70 bills assigned to our committee, and we've been dividing them out thematically. Um, and so if you want to go to the next slide, a, a hearing that we had just last week was on our health and safety bills. And I thought I'd highlight a few of those for you. These are bills that we're considering in, in the legislature to advance through the process. So one would be increasing the penalties for unfair and deceptive actions perpetrated against persons with disabilities and senior centers. It would establish a senior citizens and disabled persons abuse prevention fund to educate seniors and disabled persons about deceptive investment and marketing practices and consumer protection laws, and it would increase civil penalties for perpetrators. Just yesterday, I saw the Malden police putting out an alert on all of their um, social media platforms and email to say we're aware of a scam that's going on targeting senior housing. Uh, people are calling and asking you to give us information. We know that it's getting more sophisticated with all these digital perpetrators, so this is a bill to try to keep up with that. Another bill that we heard last week would be to establish an office of elder advocate. So I think this is a great one. We have a child advocate in the state. I'm familiar with that office because I worked with it in education, looking out for children, including those who are most vulnerable. So this would sort of mirror that and create an independent office of the elder advocate to ensure that older adults and people with disabilities have access to services, that they're always receiving humane and dignified treatment. They would sort of investigate and examine state agencies that are providing the services to make sure we're doing a good job of that and just generally improving um, state government for services for these individuals. Uh, another bill that we heard about was a, to establish a commission to study the financial abuse of elders. So it would study how financial abuse is targeted toward those over 60, talk about lending and refinancing practices of companies that are targeting people over 60, um, looking into real estate transactions, other examples of fraud like telemarketing, and I think this is a really important one as well. So this would be create a commission that we would stand up, would meet periodically, and then write a, probably a report to inform the legislature about laws that we needed to update. One that's related to that is one that I actually filed around um, seniors' financial literacy. So we do a lot of that in early, the early education and K-12. This would also direct the state treasurer to create a curriculum, a model curriculum that places like the councils on aging could roll out to sort of talk about you're getting ready for retirement. There are a lot of financial decisions you need to make around your housing, your health care, um, estate planning, your real estate and such. So how do you do that? We we'll create a curriculum that it could be then provided around the state. Um, one more that we heard about last week was an act protecting vulnerable elders from abuse. This was an interesting one. So we don't have a state agency that actually is specifically authorized to examine abuse of older folks in certain settings like uh, in places of incarceration, prisons, or homeless shelters. It seems like a real gap. So this would make it clear that our Executive Office of Elder Affairs can and specifically investigate those types of allegations. So the other thing I want to flag is we had this hearing, that's us in the hearing room. You all can always come to the State House, sit in on any of these hearings. We also now have a hybrid approach. So if you ever wanted to testify on one of these bills, you can either come and do it in person or you can log in over your phone or computer and provide three minutes of testimony on any bill that is of interest to you. You can also always watch our hearings. We live stream them on the Massachusetts Legislature website. So lots of ways to be involved. The other thing that we did that I'm really excited about is on June 15th, our committee reported out a big comprehensive bill around nursing home reform, long-term care reform. This is a huge deal. The Speaker of the House has introduced, has flagged this as one of his priorities this session. And we know that nursing homes really suffered during the COVID pandemic, but they were already sort of in trouble before it. So the bill does a lot of things and for the purposes of this focus on elder abuse and, and protection, a couple things that are in this bill, which I actually, I filed it with um, the chair, the House Chair Stanley, and then we revised it with uh, member input and input from different stakeholders. 
but it will give the Department of Public Health additional tools to monitor and take punitive action on facilities that aren't protecting their residents properly, that aren't mitigating outbreaks, that aren't making sure that, you know, we have minimum number of beds per room so that, that people have more autonomy and privacy where they're living. It also really importantly increases the penalties that the Attorney General can bring in actions about abuse and neglect. We increase them tenfold, which is a big deal. And we extend the statute of limitations, which is how long from the moment that the abuse occurred to when an action needs to be brought for it to be timely. Right now, our state law says you have two years to do that. We would give her four year, her or him, whoever is the Attorney General, four years to do that. When the office came before us to testify, they confirmed it's not going to slow them down um, in terms of being aggressive about incidents that they hear about, but it will give them an opportunity to go farther back in time if they learn about something later. So that's really important. It adds more tools for protections for our seniors. So two big things happening in the committee just last week. So then also, I just wanted to flag some things that are happening more locally, including what my office has done. So I mentioned that I filed one bill about seniors' financial stability. That's having the treasurer create a model curriculum. Another thing that we do, and I know that she couldn't be here today, is we work with other state offices. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, District Attorney Marion Ryan, who has been such an advocate, a, an amazing champion for seniors in the Middlesex County, um, you know, we reached out to each other and have agreed to collaborate sometimes on bills that I might file based on observations and experiences she's had in cases she's brought. One bill that we've worked on together the last session and this session is this one that's at the top slide, House Bill 1635, an act to protect property of elder disabled persons. I'm happy to let her speak more about the specific case, but it just makes it clearer that if someone who is older is planning to um, bestow property um, to somebody else, to a caregiver, there needs to be someone witnessing that to confirm that the senior person has full faculties and is not being taken advantage of. And this comes out of an unfortunate example where the district attorney tried to prosecute a person who clearly was, um, you know, fraudulently taking the the um, the property, but the level of requirements in the statute weren't clear enough to make the case. So so you'll see that bill actually didn't go to Elder Affairs. It went to the Joint Committee on the Judiciary. So in addition to our Elder Affairs Committee, you may see bills all at all different levels of um, state committees that might be of interest to you. I also want to draw your attention to a community conversation that I hosted a year and a half ago or so on Elder Affairs. We talked about sort of caregivers, family agency, the work staff that is supporting people in assisted living and in long-term skilled nursing facilities. You can find that on my YouTube channel. Um, and I also just want to raise up the Councils on Aging here in Wakefield and in Melrose where I often hold office hours and I'm just so grateful for Karen Burke and her team here and then say, um, Stacey Mancello down in um, Melrose. I know they put on great, you know, programming for you, great resources, and I'm always available to be a partner in, in thinking through what, things that you all need at the state level. So with that, I'll close out and just say that's my contact information. I have some cards at the table. Um, you're welcome to stop by after this. And I'm really grateful for the chance to give you a bit, brief update on what's happening um, on Beacon Hill. Thank you. Welcome, Marion. <laughs> We're glad you were able to make it. Um, Marion Ryan, since 2023, oh, not again. <laughs> since 2013, Middlesex District, District Attorney Marion Ryan has had the privilege of leading the office in which she has spent her entire professional career. Her strategic vision is simple. Every day, the Middlesex District Attorney's Office serves to be the most dedicated, the most effective, the most transparent, and the most innovative public prosecutor's office in the United States. 
During District Attorney Ryan's tenure, the office has created dozens of best-in-the-class crime prevention programs. The office has expanded the use of restorative justice practices and drastically expanded the office's divisionary offerings. District Attorney Ryan has served as a vocal and persuasive voice calling for smart, common sense reforms to the criminal legal system. She also created a cold case unit that has delivered justice and answers in decade old crimes. District Attorney Ryan knows that none of these or the office's many other successes during her tenure would have been possible without the exceptional effort and talent of its many professionals. District Attorney Ryan grew up in Somerville and is a summa cum laude graduate of Emanuel College and a cum laude graduate of Boston College Law School. Please welcome Miriam to the mic. for having us. You know, I was thinking as we were driving here, it's been a really long time since I've been here. So it's very nice to be back and to see all of you. And I'm glad you had an opportunity to hear, before I talk a little bit from Representative Lipper Garabedi, and she has been a great partner in looking out for your interests. And you are well served by her understanding of what the issues are and her willingness to partner with us on the bills that we filed. And of course, you have the Wakefield Police here. They are great partners as well. I could not do what we do here in Middlesex without our police departments, who are always willing to try something new when we call and say, we're seeing something, what can we do? They are always willing to learn to think about how to be creative about it. And that goes to what my overall point of today is. If you read the newspaper or you watch TV and you hear all of these people who lose money, right? They give money away to somebody, they get scammed in some way. The real way to figure out how to protect yourself is to think about what they're thinking. So we're not going to have the police wonder why I'm telling you how to be a criminal, but that's what I'm going to tell you, all right? If you are a scammer, that is your full-time job. Just like whatever it is that you do or did for a job, you wanted to be good at it, and you basically wanted to go to work, do your job, be left alone, and get accomplished what you needed to accomplish. That is exactly what scammers want to do. All right, so the best ways to protect yourself are number one, not to be a good target. And that is primarily by not responding to whatever it is they want. If you think about anybody in this room, if you walked in here right now and said, someone just called me and told me my granddaughter's in trouble and could I go and get $17,000 out of the bank and send it to a post office box, was send it to the messenger, right? Exactly what I just heard, everybody in here would laugh. And everybody in here would say to you, don't be silly, you don't wanna do that. And yet, every single week across this very large county, we have probably a half dozen people who do exactly that. All right, and why do they do that? It's not because they're not smart. It's not because they're not financially savvy. It is primarily because they don't have the benefit of this room. Because they hear it in their own house, often when they're by themselves, and their imagination kind of spins out there, and they get caught up in it. So many, and the police will confirm this, so many times when people come to us, they say, and it's really very sad, I don't know what I was thinking. I just got scared. I thought my granddaughter was in trouble. And I, I, as quickly as I could, I wanted to help. So the very first thing, if you remember nothing else from today about how to protect yourself, and protecting yourself means not only not becoming victimized, but also hanging on to your money. You worked really hard for that money. 
how much money you have is going to determine how the next 10, 20 years unfold. And even when we are successful, when we catch the scammer, when we're able to prosecute them, when they're convicted, we probably are not getting your money back because the money's long gone. So the very first thing to remember is slow everything down. If you get that call, if you picked, and I'll talk about how you shouldn't answer the phone anyway, but if you did answer the phone and you get that call, just take a breath and think about calling somebody that you trust call the police department. They do not care that you are bothering them. They are there 24 seven. They would rather you called before you gave away the money. And just say, I just got this call. Does this sound okay? Because in the same way that if I came in the room and said, somebody just called me in my car and said, your granddaughter's in trouble, give me $15,000. When you hear yourself say it out loud, you're going to think, yeah, that's not really a good idea. All right? So slow everything down. I promise you, remember what I said about what the scammer wants. If you say, yeah, I can't decide that right now, or call me back next week, you will not hear back from them because they have moved on. They want to get, they have a certain amount of money they want to bring in every day. If you're not going to be helpful, unfortunately, they're moving on to somebody who will answer faster. So the safest thing is to slow it down. Where that also particularly applies, and we are in the season where you will see this, we have an enormous number of cases where someone shows up at your house. They have tar from a driveway job. They would like to cut down your trees. They will clear off your gutters. They will get rid of the mosquitoes that are around your house. They will do any number of jobs, all right? One simple rule that will protect you is think about this. Every one of you in this room has made a contract for something important. You bought a house, you bought a car, you bought a refrigerator, you did something. Not one of you executed that contract or did that contract standing on your front steps, right? You just don't. You did not just walk up to somebody and say, I think I'll pay you $35,000 for your house. You just didn't do that. So you should have just a rule which will be a muscle memory and will really help you. I don't make contracts on the front porch. So when somebody comes to the door, and says, I've got the tar for your driveway, I've got the wood for your deck, whatever it is. If you just routinely say, very nice of you to offer, I don't discuss contracts here, please give me the information. Again, I promise you will not see them again because they will go to the other three houses and mess up their driveway. So the longer you engage, the more likely you are to give away the money. That's just a reality. So if you don't get into the big conversation, if you just have a line, and I say all of these things, being a complete failure in my own family, all right? My husband is the most polite man in the world. When people call and start to sell me things, I say, sorry, bad time, and I hang up. My husband is five minutes into the conversation about, I'm really sorry, we're in the middle of dinner. Yes, we're having lasagna for dinner. He's long down the conversation, okay, because he just cannot hang up. Hang up. They are trying to put their hand in your pocket. Just hang up on them. The second is when you open that door. And this is, this is one of the things that concerns me even more than people losing their money. When you are in your house, what protects you from everybody else who's out there is that locked door. Do not open that locked door. Not only is it probably going to be harder for you to shut the door in somebody's face, but probably none of us, maybe a couple of us, 
are a match for somebody trying to push our way in the house. And more than not losing your money, you don't want to be physically harmed. And people can be very intimidating, especially if you're home alone. All of a sudden, they're kind of backing you up. Or we have the, all right, I'll go, but could I just bother you for a glass of water? Can I use the bathroom? And all of a sudden, they're in the house. And it's very hard then to get them out of the house. And I'll give you an example. We had a woman, we prosecuted a case recently where a woman was in her house. There had been a terrible windstorm. A lot of branches had come down. She knew she had branches on her trees that needed to come down. She was kind of thinking about what to do with it. Guy came to the door, said, I can help you. I've just been over on the next street. I can take down those branches for you. She thought, great. I do have these branches. It's clearly a problem. So he goes to work. He and his buddy go to work. They take the branches down. They come to the back door. One of them is kind of holding his power tool down here, you know, with this finger on the button. And they're in the kitchen. They then tell her the price is $17,000. OK? Now, she didn't actually ask them the price. Again, a reason why you don't do contracts on the front porch. She's home alone. She's got these two big guys in her kitchen, one with this thing. She was smart. They were clearly being intimidating. Your personal safety is the most important thing. She wrote them a check to just get them out of the house. Because when she kind of went back and forth with them about, I didn't expect that, well, you didn't ask us. And we had to go you know, three feet higher and use a rope and whatever else. She wrote the check. The second she locked the door behind them, she called the police. And the police, being as well trained as our folks are, knew that the fastest way to cash a check, if I give you a check, the fastest way for you to actually have the cash in your hand is to go to my bank. So they, because if you go to my bank, if I give you a Bank of America check, and you go to Bank of America and cash it. You get the money right then. They literally reach into my account and take it out. There's no possibility of stopping payment on the check. Whereas if they took it to their bank to cash it, you would have time before it made its way back to Bank of America to stop payment. So the police, knowing that, went immediately to her bank. Guess who was in the lobby cashing that check? OK? So that goes to, number one, having that contract when you didn't really know what you were buying. That's not how you bought any other important thing in your, in your life. And second of all, your personal safety is at risk the second you let them in the house. Now, I was doing one of these a while ago, and I went through my whole story. And at the end, a woman came up to talk to me. And she said, it was winter, and she said, you know, I felt so badly for the poor man. It was cold. I said, would you like to come in and warm up? And I thought, I am a failure. <laughs> All right, I am a failure. Let them be cold. Let them be wet. Send them away. But that lock should remain on your door. And if they're not leaving, or they haven't shown you some identification, or you don't know why they're there, that's when you should be calling 911. The police will ha be happy to come over and help them down off the front stairs. So think about all of those pieces. When it comes to the scams that we are seeing on computers and electronically now, which is where most of them are, the grandparent scam is by far the most common. And I want you to just think about one piece of that. If you got a phone call that said, your granddaughter's in trouble, and you only had grandsons, you would hang up right away, right? You would know, I don't have a granddaughter, goodbye. The reason people get hooked in is because when people call, they have a little bit of truth. They are saying something that you realize is true. Your granddaughter, Elizabeth, who's in Greece, and you know your granddaughter is on a trip. How do they know that? 
they're not just guessing. Right? Social media is huge. Nothing, I promise you nothing good happens on Facebook. As the police will tell you, many people come to the police station and say, my house was broken into. My husband and I went away overnight. No one knew we were away. <laughs> well, it takes us about seven minutes to go on Facebook. The bad guys are on Facebook. All right, so keep that in mind. When your granddaughter got into college and they had that day where all the kids wear their sweatshirt of the place they're going and you posted that picture all over the place, now when you get the phone call that says your, daughter, your granddaughter at UMass is in trouble, they didn't look that hard. All right, the other piece, and again I say that I am a huge failure in this aspect. My father has 12 grandchildren. If you sat beside him at the doctor's office for five minutes, I promise you, you would know the first name of every one of them, you would know what sport they played, and you would know where they went to school. And helpfully, he would have said it all in his Irish whisper, so any of those of you in the back of the room who didn't hear it, you know. I literally have been places where people stop me and say, oh, you must be M Michael and Elizabeth's mother. I don't know them, all right? So be careful. When we talk about personal information, people think it's your bank account, your social security number. Be careful about what you're spreading around. And I challenge you to think about this. The next time you go to the doctor, the blood, clinic, blood lab, the dialysis, whatever it is, sit and listen for a few minutes because this is a common conversation. You've come out of wherever you are, you have to make the next appointment. So you're there with the nice lady behind the counter who you see all the time, and she says, how about July 17th? Well, no, I can't do July 17th because my niece Julia's getting married in Georgia. Okay, she heard you, so did everybody else. All right, if I'm a bad guy, I'm out mining for information. That is why when you get the call on July 16th, that says Julia's on her way to a wedding and she's had a car accident, you will immediately, your heart will start racing because that's true. And yet you put it out there. So just be really careful. You know, we all chat. Just don't chat in detail. They don't need to know your grandch grandchildren's names. I, I can't convince my father otherwise, but I'm hoping that maybe I can convince you. So think about that. That is by far the most common scam right now. The second is Social Security. Social Security, I promise you, unless you have initiated a contact with them, is not calling you. So if somebody calls you and says it's Social Security, and you haven't reached out to them, there is a 99.99% .99 chance it is a scam. Especially if it begins with them asking for your social security number. Think about that, they gave it to you. Why are they asking you for it? All right, again, like that's just a common sense piece. The same is true with your bank. If your bank calls you and you haven't reached out to them, and they start with your account number, I'm gonna be really worried if they don't know my account number. So just don't give that information. And if you are worried and you want to call them back, this is a mistake that people make all the time. Do not call with the number they called you from. Because right now for $29.99, if you go online, you can buy a spoofer that will make your phone number be any other number you want. So if you've ever noticed, you may get um, scam calls that look like your local number. So I live in the 617-489. I often get those kind of calls. They've made it look that way. So I will think that's a neighbor, that's someone in town, and I will pick it up. So when you get a call that says Washington, D.C., and you think it's Social Security, it is Joe Scammer in Wakefield, <laughs> all right? And he has just made his number look like a Washington number. So if you call back, 
go get your bank statement or something and get the number of the bank. Call, look up the number for Social Security for your office. I promise you they will not have called you. So be sure you make that connect. And finally, the other really common one right now is the tech scam. You are online and they suddenly say, you get a message that pops up and says, or you get a call that says, stop right now. You're about to hit a virus zone or something. And luckily, if you send us $99 a month, we will rescue you. Don't touch your computer anymore because that wall of protection, every time, they, once they're on the phone, every key you press is punching another hole in your firewall. That will lead them to have access to <coughs> banking information, all of that other information that's on your phone. So those are the three most common. That is the, those are the ways to protect yourself from that. But I will end by just saying, people worry about those scammers who are gonna get you. The vast majority, and it is a significant amount of money, that people lose is to their friends and family. It really isn't to strangers. It is to children, grandchildren, nieces or nephews, who you've given access to your bank accounts. All right, you have a joint bank account. Again, I am a total family failure. I have nine elderly aunts, every one of them, and I have a joint bank account <laughs> for no good reason. Um, because if they get sick or die, I'm to administer everything. All right, and that's all fine to do that, but if you are doing that, if you go to Florida for some of the year and you want your children to be able to pay some bills, if you are worried that you might get sick and you want somebody to have access to money, make sure all that is in that account is what you could afford to lose. Because it is not even a question of can we not prosecute them, we legally can't. If you and I have a joint bank account, even if every penny in that account is yours, you sold your house, you got $700,000, you put it into that joint bank account with me, I now legally own that money exactly the same as you. So if I take 699000 out of there tomorrow, the police can't charge me, and I can't be prosecuted because that money belonged to me. I have no obligation to use it for you, and I have no obligation to treat it as yours. That in Massachusetts is the single biggest way to lose money. It's convenient to have a joint account, but it is a trap. So you should always be sure that what is in there is what if the other person, and we all set up that account, right, because we trusted whoever it was, your daughter, your granddaughter, you trusted them, you thought they'd take care of you. Life unfolds. People have bad divorces, people have children with issues, <coughs> people lose their job. I would be a very wealthy woman if I had a dollar for every time we have heard in a case Mom wouldn't mind if I just this month paid my mortgage out of that account. I'm going to put it back. I'll have a job next month, and I'm going to put it back. No money has ever gone back into those accounts. And more sinister, we hear often from people, Mom refuses to do whatever it is that I want her to do, and, so, and the nursing home is going to take it all. So it's better that I help myself now, I guess, right? That's what people have told us. You know, we were gonna lose it anyway, and I just spent it. Your mother might not have been finished with it, but you're still spending it, all right? So you are much more likely to lose it either in that situation or you're lending people your debit card or your credit card. Once they have your password, you're not gonna be protected from that. So I know that's a terrible view of humanity. And again, as I say, I'm a total failure in telling my own family those lessons. But if you can remember to think about that, to slow things down, to not make contracts on the curb, 
and to always reach out to somebody, whether it's the police, somebody here at the senior center, your friends, to say out loud what you're thinking about doing, you will have gone a very long way in defeating the people who are trying to help themselves to your resources. So thank you for having me. I know that's a lot of fun. Thank you, Marianne. That was wonderful. Thank you. I would now like to introduce somebody. Katie Cooley. Okay. Kate Rep serves as Protective Services QI Specialist Community Liaison at Mystic Valley Elder Services, Inc. Kate graduated from Endicott College with a degree in psychology. Kate has worked with various age groups in different professional settings, but has always had a special connection to working with elders. She has worked in the Protective Service Department for over 10 years, initially as a caseworker until recently becoming their quality improvement specialist. Kate lives on the North Shore with her husband, their daughters, and their two dogs. Please welcome Kate to the microphone. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you guys for having me today. I appreciate that. It's nice to see so many new faces. You need to get up closer to the mic. Oh. Yell at me now. I can yell at you. Is that better? <laughs> this one? <laughs> All right. Nice to meet everyone. It's nice to be here today. It's a bit daunting to follow Kate and Marion, but I'm here to share a little bit of information from Mystic Valley regarding the services that we provide. Some of you may be familiar, some of you may be consumers, others may not be as familiar with what we offer. So I did bring packets and bags that have some information you can refer to either now while I'm speaking or afterwards, you can bring that home with you. Um, but some of the services and resources that we provide before I get into the protective services program um, include the home care department, which you know, we um, provide personal care, homemakers, uh, we have a nutrition department that delivers balanced meals, home um, hot meals for people in our communities. We have a caregiver support specialist program that is educational, provides support groups that meet regularly, that do home visits with um, caregivers of our elders. So those are all wonderful programs that we offer. But Elder Protective Services, since it is elder um, abuse awareness, that's what I'm here to speak a little bit more in depth about. That's my more area of ex expertise where I have worked for over 10 years. So just wanted to run through what, how we're defined, what we look at, and also the process of filing reports. For those of you who, I'm sorry, can you hear better now? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if this is better, the goal of our protective services program is to prevent, remedy, and eliminate the effects of abuse on or self neglect on elders. Um, and you can go into the next. The people that we serve in our communities are 60 years and older. Those living in the community versus um, inpatient facilities, long-term care facilities. So we work with people who are still living in the community in their home. And those who have an ongoing personal relationship with the alleged abuser. So to clarify, we don't, we wouldn't be working so much with relationships between a tenant and a landlord. Sometimes we, we get calls of concern regarding relationships of that nature that is beyond the scope of our jurisdiction but more so with an elder who has a, a spouse or an adult child or grandchild who is their ultimate caregiver um, things of that nature so the 101 of elder abuse i'm just going to kind of bring it back to the basics the types of abuse that we look at 
include physical abuse, emotional and verbal abuse, caretaker neglect, self-neglect, and financial exploitation. Marion really went into depth with the financial exploitation. We're seeing a lot of that now, but the other areas are, are equally important to take a look at and to understand um, physical abuse. Some things that are included, it does seem certain ones are obvious. Fractures, broken bones, welts, um, choking, any, any physical hands-on aggressive nature um, that falls within the physical abuse category. Um, indicators, some are more obvious than others, burns, lacerations, bruising, um, things like that. So things to keep in mind, some are more obvious than others, but it's red flags to be aware of. Emotional abuse, verbal abuse, kind of together. Um, indicators of this, obviously a lot less obvious, um, more subtle, but things to keep in the back of your mind as you are interacting with loved ones, and this may be red flag behavior. Excessive fear, um, signs of lack of sleep or excessive sleep, change in appetite, unusual weight loss or gain, withdrawn um, behavior or isolation. That is very common, actually, someone who used to be really active out in the community, and you're seeing a shift in their behavior suddenly it's worth starting a conversation about or giving us a call and kind of talking it out with us. Um, but if a neighbor you see usually is out tending to their garden or out running errands, and then you see a sudden shift in that kind of day-to-day -day routine for them, that could be an indicator of something else going on. So absolutely worth looking into and, and bringing up with us if you feel it's necessary to. Neglect, I split this into two categories, but ultimately the, in, the indicators of caregiver neglect and self-neglect are very similar. Um, abandonment, disregard for personal safety, conditions in the home that are concerning, you know, hoarding issues, you know, excessive clutter, things, people who aren't being able to take care of their, their living environment in a safe and healthy way inadequate food um, or supervision. Unfortunately, we do have situations where an elderly neighbor, an elderly loved one goes out on a daily walk and then as they become a little bit more forgetful, can forget their way home sometimes and, and there are often issues with wandering. We tap into our police departments a lot of the time when we have a situation like that with the silver alerts. Um, it's really crucial with, with elders who have memory loss issues to keep that aware of as, as an option and as an idea moving forward to keep them safe. Other indicators of neglect, um, people who are presenting with malnourished or dehydrated, um, concerns with their personal care, people who aren't bathing or, or grooming as frequently as they used to or as often as they need to, Mismanagement of medications, that can be a neglect issue. It could also be a caregiver issue. It's worth exploring if you, if you have any kind of concerns in that area. Um, I think some of these I already touched on. Financial exploitation, going back to um, some of the things that Marion was bringing up. These scams, um, fraudulent activity, we're seeing such an increase in, in an aggressive nature with people who are being contacted by scammers. It is happening all over. It's happening with every age group, actually. Um, and it is really, really crucial for people to stay savvy, to not share their personal information, so not to be redundant, but really to emphasize the points that Marion was making. So these are becoming incredibly, incredibly common, and we just really encourage you not to share any sort of personal information by phone, even if it's a concerning or questionable email that you get or text, anything on social media, to absolutely avoid anything like that. But these are the types of abuse um, and neglect that we often see or that people call us with concerns about. So if you do suspect or have concerns that someone you know or yourself, you may be victimized, um, 
what what are your options? What are your next steps? And so there are options to either contact the elder abuse hotline. That's the number. It's also in a pamphlet in the envelopes that I provided provided for you. The hotline is open. It's a centralized intake system. So all of the intakes, all of the calls that they get throughout the state are centralized through one office and then dispersed to the local agency. So any reports pertaining to the communities that we cover, um, which are 11 communities from North Reading down to Malden, Everett, um, we would get those related to our communities. And then at that point, a screener at our, you can go on, sorry. When a report is received, a screener would determine whether or not we have enough information and it's pertinent enough to what we would be able to investigate ourselves. They would assign it to a worker who would conduct an investigation if it is screened in. Sometimes we don't have enough information to determine that there is a, a serious concern of abuse or neglect and it may be screened out. It may just ultimately be that the reporter didn't have enough information to file a full report. And that can be a reason why a report is screened out. That's not to say a report is not worth filing. We would absolutely encourage if anyone ever had any concerns or questions to reach out to us or to file a report either online or with the hotline. Absolutely much better to err on the side of caution than to not, even if there is a potential outcome of the report being screened out. Even if you feel like you've reported in the past about something similar, if you see the same ongoing concerns with that person, feel free to call us back and you can bounce those concerns off of us again. We can revisit it if necessary. When a report is substantiated, so after an investigation of a report of concern, if there's enough evidence that we find to substantiate a case, if that if we're able to collect enough information to say there, there is enough evidence that abuse or neglect took place, what we would do is we would open that case for ongoing services and a worker would continue to work with that elder, with their family often, with the involved caregiver, whatever other um, participants are involved in that situation and help stabilize and eliminate the risk that is facing that elder. So often we do, and the reason why I went through the, the programs we offer through Mystic Valley is often we work with the caregivers. We refer them to the caregiver specialist program because a lot of the time we're seeing people who are trying their very best to provide care to their loved ones and they just don't have the education, the information, the support themselves to do what they need to do to care for their loved ones. A lot of the time it's just a need for additional support, additional services, and we're able to help coordinate that and get them on a safer track. So that's, that's sort of along the lines of what happens after a case is opened. A few things to think about, and I know that it can be a source of frustration for reporters at times, is if a report is provided to us and we do an investigation and we see that an elder is making choices that maybe are not in their best interest or not preferable, but ultimately it is their own decision to live their life in a certain way, self-determination, that is a, a crucial piece of how we operate in protective. And it's something that we have to remind family members and reporters sometimes is that ultimately, even if we wish that the person would make a better choice or a safer choice, if they have the clarity and, and the capacity to make their own decisions legally, then we have to respect that and we can just work to try to encourage them to accept some additional services and additional care to live their best and healthy life but we do have to remember that they are their own individuals and we are in place to help people stay safe in the community, make the choices in the life that they want to live and, and respect their self-determination. Um, oh, sorry, just one, no, the least restrictive and appropriate intervention 
Something Amy and I talked about before, um, dispelling fears in reaching out to protective. I, I know that a lot of people can be hesitant to reach out to us or to contact us, whether it is on their own behalf or on behalf of a loved one, because they fear that protective is going to become involved and make some very drastic and immediate choices or action remove people from their home or arrest someone who might be, you know, not treating them well. We're not law enforcement. We are, we are involved to try to address immediate concerns, but we are not there to remove anyone from their home and make any drastic or, or permanent decisions on their behalf. What we ultimately want to do is eliminate the risks that they're facing, help support them in whatever way we can try to provide some education and resources and keep people safe and healthy in the community. So um, that's our number for Mystic Valley. Um, I've also got business cards for protective services. The hotline is the best number to file a report, but if you ever, ever have any questions or concerns that you just wanna have a dialogue with someone, you just wanna talk it out with somebody, please, I encourage you to call us during Monday through Friday, regular business hours. And we're happy to have a conversation to just, you know, you don't have to give us the person's n name. You don't have to give us any specific demographic information, but you can just kind of talk out the situation and, you know, bounce some ideas back and forth. Um, and if we can guide you in any direction or to someone that might be more directly involved and able to provide care, then we would also do that. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for sh sharing all that information with us. Um, Thank you. <laughs> we need the Wakefield Savings Bank. Yes. Yeah, okay. I can just find it. Where'd it go? Got it. You were the first one on my list, but you're not the first one talking. <laughs> Cheryl A. Cannon is here with the Wakefield Savings Bank. She's going to speak to us about finances, etc. Prior to joining the Savings Bank, Cheryl worked for eight years at the, at the statewide coordinator for the Massachusetts Money Management Program. The program served over 1,500 elders throughout the state by aiding the program assistant elders who are having difficulty managing personal budgets by keeping track of their bank records, balancing checkbooks, and helping pay bills. As the statewide coordinator, Cheryl often presented at elder events about elder fraud and scams. She continues to work today through the Savings Bank's community outreach. Please el welcome her to the mic. Well, thank you all for having me. I appreciate being able to come and talk to you today. It's difficult being the last one coming up. Um, you guys have been very patient. It's like a stand-up com comedy show and everyone stole my jokes. Um, <laughs> but I am going to hopefully give you some more information about protecting yourself from scams. Um, my first slide here has a quote that I really like to share with everyone. It's um, if you think that you're too smart to ever fall for a scam, you're wrong. <laughs> scammers, as we heard from the other speakers, scammers, this is their full-time job. They're very good at it. Um, they do target elders, but fortunately, elders are not the um, seniors, are not the only ones to fall for scams. The people that are most likely to fall for a scam are millennials. Um, Right here we have, uh, these are just some facts about um, scams. So, success, susceptibility, susceptibility, that's, I don't know why I put that in the slide, uh, <laughs> versus money lost. So, elders are the least likely to fall for a scam, but they're the ones that are gonna lose the most money. Millennials are the most likely, likely to fall for scams, but they have the least money to fall for, so. <laughs> 
So why do scammers target seniors? As we, I just said, they have the money. So they're more likely to have a nest egg. You've worked your whole life. You have savings. They're going to go and um, target the people with the deeper pockets. The older generation was raised to be polite. You answer the phone, you answer the door, you engage in conversation. That's what they're looking for. Sometimes we have elders who are socially isolated. That phone call might be the only call that they get that day, that week, that month. So they are going to engage in conversation. And as we all age, we know that sometimes you might have a cognitive impairment or maybe some memory issues. Um, elder financial exploitation is the crime of the century. One in 10 adults will fall victim to scam every year. One in five scam complaints come from somebody who's over 65. And the estimated loss in 2021 was at least $5.8 billion. Oh so it is a job. They're making money at it, so they're going to find new ways to scam people and new ways to take your money. So you've heard a lot about diff common scams. You can just, um, I'm going to maybe jump through these slides rather quickly. What I would like to do instead, because instead of just rehashing all this information, is maybe open it up and ask you what you've seen or scams, you know, we have people coming to the door, people calling, people emailing, people texting. Has anyone in the room recently gotten a text or an email or a call? What, what was it? Um, <clears throat> mine actually was from my Netflix. Mm -hmm. He sent me a text message stating that uh, my account was in arrears and that I needed to call and update my billing uh, information. And I went to my, went online, looked at my bank statement. I had already paid Netflix. Yep. So I called Netflix and I Perfect. said, why are you sending me these text messages? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't send you a text message. So <clears throat> I still get them. As a matter of fact, I got one um, just last week, again, mm -hmm. asking to update my billing information. Yep. And but, I I never, but I never answered it. I don't even it's open fine. it. So the best thing that you did was you didn't reply to that message, you called the source. So you called Netflix, perfect. Anyone else? Um, one of the things I notice is the English grammar is both the British, British English, which is in Africa, and their grammar is atrocious. Mm -hmm. And if you're a banker, and a high level, no offense to bankers, but if you're a banker and a high level banker, <laughs> you more or less most of the time have something that's a little correct grammar. Correct. The other trick to worry about is they put a logo up. Now, I've got two parts of the weeds here, but they put a logo up, and you're, you think you click on the logo. Well, that logo is a redirection to a different URL that sends it somewhere else. Yep. Yep. And the third trick is if you know how to read header sites, is it coming from the United States? Or is it coming from, say, some other country? And you can see if you look the headers, it's coming from here. Well, savings banks in Wakefield, if you're sending me an email, it's not coming from Russia. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not sending them out of Russia. Yep, yep. So is anyone, uh, that's great points, and I have some of that information. Again, someone's stealing my material here. Um, but it is true. When you look at an email, you can do some um, investigating to see uh, where it's coming from. I'm sorry, yes. No, uh, you know, I was going to say, I got an email, and it was in my inbox, not my spam from Rockland Trust, you know, part of their bag. And um, I, I, I immediately look at the email, and it was say, like, Rockland Trust, because I know they're original, you know, banking website and all mm -hmm. that. And you can tell it was like a funny ending, you know, and then it will say, click here, there's something wrong with your account or something, and if you click, it gives you a virus. So. But right. I had that recently, yep. you know, I never fall for it, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying, good. It's a good thing to look at. Yep. Let me just, sorry. Oh, good. Yeah, that's all right. Did you have something to add? Yes, I did. Talking about someone getting into the computer, a dear friend of mine um, who lives in Hampton also, um, he's somewhat <coughs> isolated, and he was on his computer, and all of a sudden he got a, um, an email saying that this was um, uh, 
was it Go Nerds? What's the nerd thing that helps Geek you? Geek Squad. Geek Squad. Mm -hmm. um, saying that we notice that your uh, contract has ended, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. You know, we need to help you. You seem to be having problems right now. So click on this. So he did. He wound up losing thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, the more he stayed on his computer, he had already given him access. And this guy had no firewalls whatsoever because he had Microsoft that was probably back in the 1990s. <laughs> and every keystroke and everything that he wanted to do, this guy knew. So he recorded all his keystrokes. He went into his banking. He got all his information. And mm -hmm. I finally said to him, stay off of your computer. You need to trash it. And we had to go down to his bank and close out his account, get new ATM cards, get a new credit card, and so on. Yep. And they, because we did it so quickly, they were able to recover that money you know, for him. But he lost thousands and thousands of dollars, and he didn't even know because he said, OK, I'll do a one-year contract for $29.99. Well, then <clears throat> later on in the afternoon, he gets alerts from his bank saying that, well, $7,600 and something dollars was taken out at this time, and then two hours later, $10,000 and so on was taken out. Uh, so that's one of the really more intrusive ones. Sometimes they just dump a virus, and then they call you back and say, we can um, remove that virus, but that was intrusive. I'm sorry, over here you had something? No, a friend of mine in Florida, he was from Wakefield, uh, on his phone he had an easy access for his bank account, so if he wanted to go in, all he was touch the app that he was in. In other words, his username and his password was saved. saved. So if he got a text uh, that said, your Amazon account has been corrupted. And he tapped that, if, you know, for more information, tap it. He tapped it, opened it up. As soon as he did that, they took the money out of his bank, almost $17,000. Gone. And he said he was trying to get it back, but I don't think he's going to be able to because he was negligent in putting in the username and the password, saving that in the, in the telephone. So be careful saving those. Yeah, you have to be careful when you have quick access. If you open. Maybe this is wrong. I don't know. It's always been, I don't know. Um, when you open an email and you click on their email, it, you know, like in other words, if it's supposed to be from Netflix.com, sometimes if you open it, you can read that it's not Netflix. It has something, something different. Yep. Yep. So that's always a warning sign too. So when we all set up our emails, like you might have an email A B C D at Comcast.net, but when you set it up, you set it up so your name displays, as mine would display as Cheryl Cannon. You can put that, and you can say Netflix or Amazon. So what you need to do is to see what the true email address is, and that's yeah, absolutely coming from. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else see any other scams? As a general rule, the domains, any domain that ends in GOV, belongs to a government, United States government entity town, state, federal. Anything that ends in EDU is somehow affiliated with American University. Yep. Anything that ends in US is American. Anything else, the other, any other two letters is foreign. Yep. So it gives you an idea, you can scan this, and, but there are, that gives you some idea of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So and this is just an example of how creative scammers can be. I mean, we, I have a list of scams here. You, you could give me two more pages of scams. Um, so actually, thank you so much for giving me that information. Um, the riskiest scams by age for 18 to 24 is fake checks. And then we have uh, the next group is employment scams, uh, online purchase scams investment scams, romance scams, that's 55 to 64, and for 65 plus are tech support scams, which you've already heard some. So protect yourself. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. However, some of the things, the examples that you gave me are just simple, like Netflix, you are a Netflix customer. I'm a Bank of America, I can't say that, I work for the savings bank, but <laughs> I have an old Bank of America account. I actually don't even use it truthfully. But I get emails from them and it looks legitimate, but then when you look at the URL, it's not Bank of America. So some signs that it's a scam. 
Scammers pretend to be from an organiza organization you know, like Netflix or Social Security or the IRS. And as we heard before, Social Security, IRS, they are not gonna call you. It's hard enough to get them on the phone. They're not gonna just up and call you. Scammers like to say that there's a problem. They want to get your emotions going. Your, your granddaughter is on the way to a wedding and she got in a car accident. You, it's, it's all emotional reaction. Scammers pressure you to act immediately because if you had time to stop and think about it, you'd laugh at yourself and say, this is not a scam. And also, scammers tell you how to paint a specific way. If your daughter or granddaughter is broken down on the side of the road, then you're gonna get a call from maybe a mechanic and you know they have a website and maybe you can pay. They're not gonna say, put a bag of hundreds on your back porch. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to not read through all this. It's a lot of detail, it's, but, and we already touched upon it. So how to identify a phishing scam? The message looks funny. There's spelling errors um, that check the header. So the header, you know, when you look at the URL, check the content and consider the purpose of the email. Are they trying to take money? Is this email notifying me of a payment that I know I have it on automatic payment already and there's no reason why it should um, not have gone through? Although, truthfully, I, I ignored an email that, like, I, I don't know if it was Comcast or AT&T saying your payment didn't go through. Well, my credit card on file had expired and my payment really didn't go through. So the best thing to do is to look at the source of your payment and actually check to see if it did go through or not. Some things to do when you think you're being scammed or to protect yourself. The best thing is just to be alert and be aware that scams happen. So today you heard a lot about scams um, on elders, the grandparent scam, the scams about home improvements. If you're aware that these things are happening, you're less likely to fall for them. Resist the pressure to act quickly. Um, I, my husband, whenever anyone calls and wants to sell them something, he goes, yep, just send me information in the mail and I can look it over and read it and I'll call you back. Stop and talk to someone you trust. A lot of times the scammers want you to act quickly because they don't want you to go talk to someone and get a second opinion because they're just going to say, oh, seriously, Judy, do you really think that's happening? So um, we'll just skip. Um, if, you get, if you do happen to fall for a scam and you give a scammer information, there are things that you can do to mitigate your losses. So if you gave out your bank account number, immediately call the bank. The bank can freeze your accounts, and you know, you, later on you might have to go down and close your account and open a new one, but at least you're protecting your money. If you gave out your credit card information, call your credit card company. It's so easy, I mean, I, I've gotten um, charges on my credit card that weren't initiated by me and I just call the credit card company, they shut off that card, send you a new card. The nice thing is your account stays intact. They don't have to do anything, so that card number that you gave out is no longer active and you can still continue to use your account. If you gave out your social security number, then you want to contact one, of, or, one or three of the credit reporting agencies so you can actually place a credit freeze on your account. So that if somebody has your social security number and they're going to um, try to get credit or accounts under your name, if you freeze your credit, then you get notified every time there's an inquiry. One of the things that I learned when I was working with the money management program and protective services is the idea about time. Time is on your side. If a scammer wants you to act quickly, so the more time you take, the less likely you're gonna fall for the scam. But if the, in that sense, the scam, once the scammer 
gets your information and you fall for the scam, the time is on their side because th they have all the information and they will quickly drain your accounts. So you need to act quickly, let your bank know, let your credit card company know, call the credit bureaus and stop the um, scam. I put this in, today I was here to talk about scams, but I always, again, working with elders and financial um, exploitation, and the, the other side is that um, Katie talked about, was with uh, protective service and elder services, where it's usually a caregiver or a family member, someone that the elder knows is taking their funds. So this is more information on you know how their withdrawal activity will change, and if there's a new neighbor or friend that's really helping the, an elder with their banking that just came into their life recently, or um, elder concerns they are, don't know about why there's a debit card on their account or um, why they're not getting their bank statement. Maybe someone is helping them, helping them with their finances or helping themselves to their money. Um, and at the end, I have some resources. So if you do need some help, with finances or if you fell victim to a scam, um, there's, or if you uh, know someone who needs help with uh, financial exploitation, there's the Elder Abuse Hotline, the Money Management Program, the uh, three agencies in our area, Mystic Valley, Greater Lynn Senior Services, and Merrimack Valley Elder Services. Um, and then if you go to Mass Home Care, you can get information if, if you know someone in a different area of the state. Uh, just some more resources about scams that are out there. And at la the last slide is the three numbers for the credit um, bureau contacts in case you gave out your information and you want to put a freeze on your credit. So that's all I have for today. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you very much. A lot of information for us to intake. Um, our last speaker for the day is um, Officer Amy Rando. She has been an officer for 13 years, seven of which she served as the town's family service officer. Prior to becoming a police officer, Amy worked in supportive housing for elders and disabled persons as a quality of life coordinator and home health aide. Amy has been a member um, of WAVE since 2015, and I was also a past president of WAVE. Amy, I welcome you to the podium. I think I'll be plenty loud enough, and I promise you I will be brief because I know that this has gone a little bit over what we expected. Um, so nice to meet you all. Uh, I know a lot of you. I've spoken here before. Um, almost every topic that I could have spoken to you about, we had experts in their fields today discuss that with you. I'm not going to re-go over any of that. Um, I just wanted to put a face to a name in case any of you haven't met me. I did hand out my business card at a lot of the tables, so if you do have any concerns about a friend, a loved one, any concerns about yourself, you can give me a call and I can try to help point you in the right direction. Um, one initiative that we did do, we have this laminated card here, and we had actually put these in the light department bills that went out about six months ago. And this is to warn of common scams, scams that we've seen or seen in other uh, areas, and especially when we have an uptick in scams, we do try to put that out on social media, which we recognize not everyone has it. So we did try to put this out to individuals. I'm gonna ask you guys for some help. If you ever go to a CVS, a Walgreens, they have those you know, uh, Western Union stations where you can send money out. Oftentimes, a scammer will ask you to go and do that. Um, Detective Silva had actually gone out to a lot of these businesses, and he asked that they post this card near those machines, and also tried to train the managers on how to recognize signs um, of, of someone. It could be an elder, a younger person. We've seen plenty of younger people being scammed. Um, what to look for and to try to intervene 
you know, do you know where you're sending that money? What is that for? Maybe you should call the police. So we did have these posted. If you don't see one of these cards posted, give me a call. I'd love to replace it. Um, we had also gone around to our banks and I'm happy to report um, the savings bank. I've been a member there for a very long time and as is most of my family. And my dad was trying to make a withdrawal of a few thousand dollars and they, they said, sir, well, who, where is that money going? Are you sure that that person needs that money? And they stopped and asked him, and it was for a legitimate purpose, but they stopped and they asked my dad that because he is a senior citizen. So I thank the banks for being attentive to try to intervene on those scams as well. Um, and another thing, I know with the Social Security Administration um, scams, I just wanted to give you an example of someone that I had helped recently. Um, early onset of dementia, safe to live alone, safe to make their own choices, um, but they do get confused and they've fallen prey to someone maybe five or six times getting a hold of their social security check. And um, it can be really tough to navigate the system and uh, it's not always very accommodating. So she had gone down and had to wait like everyone else a few hours sometimes at the social security office and couldn't stay long enough to see it through. And she was about to be out her third uh, month in a row for check and was gonna have difficulty paying bills. So my department is always supportive of me. Um, they don't allow guns, I found out. We went to go one day, and even though I'm a uniformed officer, I couldn't bring my gun in a federal building. So we made a plan for the following week to go back. They let me take an unmarked car. I dressed in plain, coat, plain clothes with um, you know, no weapons on me whatsoever. And we sat there for hours together. And as many times as she said, this is ridiculous, I want to leave, and wanted to march out, I had her stay. And we were able to get that resolved and get all of her money back for her and put extra alerts on her account, you know, not to have someone change her info over the phone. So that's the kind of thing that I'm allowed to do in my role because it can be really hard to navigate the system. Um, and so if you ever have, you know, any concerns, please give me a call. Um, if you have a friend that you're concerned about, give me a call because I'm happy to help. Um, and again, enjoy the rest of your day. I know this went a little over schedule, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. We thank all of our presenters and for all of you joining us today. We hope you have gained some insight and know that there is always help available to you. I would also like to thank some of the others who are here with us today and always available to help and support us in our endeavors. The Senior Citizen um, Group with Karen Burke leading it allowing us to be here and always being available to us, being part of WAVE is wonderful. Um, our police officers, you just met Amy and Craig Calabrese, Wakefield Police Officer Deputy Chief being here with us today. Um, Wakefield CAT, CAT, I don't know what we would do without them. They're always here to help us. Um, Amy, our new interim director, um, has been a great source of getting something like this together for us and keeping us going. And my WAVE team, thank you for making this happen. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>